Alrighty, we are here. Oops, let's see if we can make that go away. Hide that, there we are. And there's Alexa. Hey everybody, welcome to Future hey, Forward. Guys. We are moving toward a live format. So we're experimenting with some new things today, but we have a terrific show uh, in three chapters. Uh, Alexa, I, I sense that you are out of doors. I escaped the city temporarily. I'm in the middle of the woods in Northeast Pennsylvania. And how would, how did the escape go? Did, were you, did like, do you have to pay, show an ID card? <laughs> I wish, no, it was, it was pretty painless. My, my parents and brother drove two cars to Brooklyn, picked me up and we've kind of been social distancing in a house, but it's a lot easier to do that in a house and a property that's 26 acres. Yeah, agreed. All right, so three chapters today. First, what ICON did and why it matters, which is an awesome segment, excited to start with it. And then chapter two, uh, what's going on with Apple and software, and in particular, Claris, which shockingly I found out still exists. And then finally, uh, VR. This is supposed to be its moment, but it seems like it's kind of not, and I'm not sure why that is, but we're going to talk about that. So so let's start with ICON, because ICON is, is super important, and you found it, and I'm incredibly excited. Uh, what does it mean? What, what happened? Did I... So we covered this on the show, I don't know how many months back, but there were talks about the .org domain basically being sold to a private equity firm and uh, there was a lot of backlash and so they voted and basically voted against actually continuing with the sale. So how do you think that happened? So it's a win. It's a win for the web. It's a win for the internet. Talk about it. I mean we, we covered it on the show. There was a lot of bad publicity. Yeah, we thought it was a terrible idea, if I remember correctly. I think uh, there are enough maybe guardians of the web who spoke up to the right people. Horrible, horrible. And we talked about Esther Dyson on that episode uh, and how she was on the board, not anymore. You know, ICON is one of these things that nobody ever thinks about, but it it is part of, I think, kind of so, the last, yeah, go ahead. I lost you. Yeah, it's possible. There's like a delay. Yeah, no. This, I, fa fabulous viewers, I think that we uh, we may be having like connectivity. Like five or 10 seconds. Yeah, but also you're cutting in and out. And now your picture's gone. Oh, no. Uh, I, th I think I think we will delay this and try and find it when we when you've got an an internet connection. This is a good idea, but I think the combination oh, of what happened, maybe what happened. No, I was just gonna see. Can you is my audio better if my video is closed? Mm, still cutting in and out. Um, we have nine viewers watching us. Hi, hey, you know what? Here, let's do this because we can do comments now on Facebook. So you can. Um, you can leave a comment on, on Facebook Live and we can we can respond to it. Let's see if this works. I just posted a comment. Uh, yep. All right. So let's so let's do this. Well now now that we actually have five people tuned in, Alexa Alexa will do only audio. I will do video and uh, and and we'll okay. see if we can answer some questions. Questions, anyone? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, while, while we're doing that, I, I just want to say about the about the um, icon thing. I just think at a moment when the actual web itself is kind of in danger, this goes in the unbelievably good news category. Um, it's incredibly positive. It's really exciting. Um, and, and it's important. And, and, you know, kudos to whoever at icon fought back and hopefully um, 
you know, we'll we'll uh, be able to have uh, some some feedback from from them about why they made the decision not to sell to private equity. But it's it's a very 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 good thing. Um, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> Alexa just texted me to say that she has fallen off the internet. Um, all right, I'm, I'm just going to keep going a little bit, and we'll go through kind of what we have uh, teed up. And Alexa, you can you can dial back in if you can, and we'll in, we'll include you. Back if you can. All right. Um, so I, I want to move on to chapter two because it's the one that I'm uh, most kind of uh, personally engaged in. So Apple, for the better part of the years that I was a fan, and I still am a fan ish was a soft did great software and one of the things that those of you who've been around a long while may remember is a company called claris which was an apple division and uh filemaker for example well it turns out who knew Clar claris as it turns out still exists which i did not know um and not only does it still exist um but it actually kind of works with all of the current technology that is uh, is Apple. Um, so, you know, th the headline that came out of CNBC was an Apple business you may not know that's poised to be a boom from the coronavirus. Uh, and then it talks about Apple's Claris. So now, uh, maybe I was wrong. And again, you know, this would be, you know, uh, viewers this, or listeners, this would be a good opportunity for you to jump in. If you, if you've, or if you're still a user of Claris, We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you've got a comment or a question, but 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 most importantly, how is it Claris is not dead? Alexa, did you did you know that Claris was still alive? Honestly, it might be before my time, but I've never even used it. So FileMaker was in the in its day awesome. Like it was magically awesome. Uh, but I just thought it was dead. I thought it was dead and gone. Um, and, and that brings me to two other pieces of software, and then we'll we'll mush it all together into a conversation about Apple itself. Um, so I literally just, I'm, some of you will remember that a couple of weeks ago, I kind of bashed on Apple, the Apple credit card, which I cut in half and canceled. Uh, and that was painful and difficult. And I am now officially abandoning Apple TV. Um, not because I don't like the service, or even the website or the interface, but I find the controller just horrible. And it doesn't work well, it jams up, it has a totally different interface, you slide left, and it's literally like television shouldn't be stressful. It just shouldn't be stressful. So uh, I have abandoned Apple TV and, and, and similarly, I'm surprised that Clara still exists. Um, so you know, if 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 some of the people who've tuned in, uh, oh, looks like we lost some folks, because the tech is a little shaky. Um, but 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 um, but Claris has a couple of things going, uh, besides FileMaker. Um, and I'm trying to remember what it is. There's one more. Um, but then last but not least, um, Aperture, which is the photo app that Apple, that is far and away better than anything else out there. Um, which Apple abandoned. I found this little piece of hackware. Um, uh, 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 where did it go? Um, I'll find the name of it. It's called. Um, it's called Retroactive, and Retroactive will literally allow Aperture to work again, um, which is awesome, uh, and I highly recommend it. Um, um, it essentially lets Catalina, you upgrade to Catalina and continue to be able to use the old iTunes and Aperture and a couple of other old legacy 32-bit before they went to 64. Um, so I don't understand why Apple TV sucks, but here's the irony of the Apple TV story. I found this uh, chain of comments, five reasons why Apple TV sucks. And I was like, okay, but it's dated 2008. So, you know, that was a long time ago. Maybe they maybe they heard the complaints from. So then I found this article, which is 
from 10 months ago. And it also essentially talks about why Apple TV is terrible. So 10 years later, you know, I mean, I get that every software and hardware company has products they leave in the market that they don't really love. But, you know, the fact that, and by the way, when I, when I abandon Apple TV, the hardware, I'm not ab abandoning Apple TV plus the software service. In fact, I'm now using it on my Roku. So I'm not sure why Apple needs to be in the TV hardware business anymore. And, uh, you know, may maybe some of our fans and listeners have an opinion about this. Just jump into the comments and let me know. Um, Weren't there rumors they were going to make an actual TV? Yes. There were. Do you think were. that's still a good idea? Or you just think they need to not be in the space at all? So I have a, <laughs> you know, I have no shortage of opinions on these things. I think putting any piece of hardware into a flat screen is a mistake. Roku, Apple TV, anything else. And the reason for that is your TV breaks and you have to call the manufacturer and say, my Roku broke in my 52 inch flat screen. And they say, well, bring it into the store. Well, you're not gonna do that. So what do you do? I mean, I guess I haven't ever bought an, a TV. Maybe there's a way to take, unscrew the back and take just the Roku out or just the Apple TV out. But generally, I think whenever two manufacturers try and deliver a product that has you know, two different pieces of hardware bolted together, they just blame each other whenever anything goes sideways, which I hate. Yeah, no, I mean, I, wa I wall mounted all of my TVs and if anything goes wrong with either of them, that's that's kind of it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and strangely enough, I think the TV manufacturers are okay with that, right? Like they're like, oh, okay. You mean you're gonna have to return it and you know throw it away and get a new one? You've had it for three years, buy a new one. It's like, no, I don't think so. Um, all right, so so that's enough enough Apple bashing for today, um, except to say, um, still love my iPhone, like the pricing of the new iPhone low-end model at whatever it was, $399, seemed like that was going to be a big boon for that company. But, you know, obviously COVID has slowed that down. Um, all right, so, so last but not least, let's talk about VR. So, Alexa, I don't know about you, like we talked about this last week, about all the days we spend on Zoom and Slack and like, it doesn't seem like anyone's quite got the social part of remote work. Like, it seems like that should be a, a home run for a VR experience. Put on some headgear. Yeah, but it, I don't have the gear though, do you? No. Yeah, so I, in, in the absence of that, unless you have hardcore gamers or early adopters, then it's not going to get the traction. Like the best thing any of the VR, AR companies could do is just distribute the devices for free if they actually want to see oh, adoption. Okay. You mean you're going to have to return it? And um, Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where the comments are going because they don't appear to be arriving in the feed, but they are somewhere there. Um, is it private chat? It's a, we're using StreamYard, which is a new um, a new app for us. And there should be comments, but I'm not seeing them. Um, can't post comments from, ten, so, all right, anyway, do that another day. Um, well, didn't Google experiment with like a card? It was like a cardboard, like yes. a low cost $10 device. Yeah, but, but you can't hold it. I mean, I just, I, in, in the sci-fi version of COVID land, I could imagine all of us wearing great big goggly things and sitting and looking around and waving to people and everyone has an avatar. And, you know, I could see that certainly happening. Um, I did see something cool on Zoom the other day. There's a hack out there. You can literally take your snap camera and hack it into Zoom. And then all of a sudden have all these, you know, animations and digital creatures and be underwater and like all that great, you know, snap, you know. Wait, the, uh, the filters themselves or like you need the Snapchat goggles? No, 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 the, the, the filters. I was in oh, a Zoom. Cool. I was in a Zoom call the other day, and there was a woman that it's a, a colleague of mine was talking, and I noticed that she had a cat on her head, and it was like pawing her face. And I was like, "Is that a real cat? No, it's a digital cat." And she had installed the plugin for a Snap Camera, 
and then attached it to her webcam and that had feeds the zoom feed and uh oh that's smart that's a smart yeah. uh plugin is that on I'd, chrome i'd like to think that i have it working but i uh, i i banged on it for a while and then decided it was uh it was not worth restarting my computer to see if i could make it work at least not not today um that's gonna be my goal for next week better wi-fi and a snap filter for this recording um that would be it's totally it's totally doable you know what i did I literally said, okay, if I'm going to be in front of this computer all summer long, which probably we are, um, what do I need to make my computer super awesome? And I ran, I went to crucial.com and ran their, their cool little appy thing that s sniffs your computer and tells you what you can do to upgrade it. And I'm getting a new solid state hard drive will be super fast. And I'm getting more memory, another eight gigabytes of RAM. And I'm just going to put... Vroom, 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 very fast. That's what I'm gonna do. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but have you do you work on a, a desktop or a laptop? Yes, to both. Mm. Do you I find work, yourself like using I work on a desktop, desktop a laptop, an iPhone, and an iPad. Wow. Okay. It's funny, as I work from home or I'm more more stationary, I am craving a desktop over my laptop. So I have a 27 inch desktop iMac and it, I really, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, a generous purchase gift to myself years, a couple of years ago. And yes, I think working on a laptop for long periods of time is stressful. And, and not, not only should you get a desktop, but your company should pay for it. Oh, there you go. That's going to be the next, the next employee demand. Well, desktops for everyone. Well, I mean, Home desktop. I, I just think, it, I, well, no, I, I didn't mean it as a demand. I meant it as a productivity tool. Like, mm. I mean, you're hunched over a laptop and, the, you know, somebody asked me if they could get a standing desk and they all they wanted was something to put on their dining room table that would lift the computer up like, it's like 130 bucks. I'm like, done. Like, like to me, oh, that's totally worth it. To me as a manager, in the, you know, you say, you say to your employees, if I'm asking you to work from home, and I'm asking you to manage kids under your feet or dogs or cats or you know, noisy neighbors. What can I do to make that workspace more comfortable for you? Like if you have a bad back, I mean, I want to get you a chair or back support. If you are sitting in the dark, I want to get you a $100 LED light so that you can make better video. Um, uh, to me, those kinds of, you know, a couple hundred bucks so that people, every time they sit down in front of their personal computer, you know, at home, they know that you've helped them make it work a little better. Yeah, at Glitch, we actually outfit our remote employees with a stipend, basically like a one-time furnish your home office stipend. Yeah. So the question is, for the people that weren't working from home and now are, do they get that stipend? Yeah, we. Actually, I think we when we closed the office, we just told everyone, take what you need. And so I think some folks actually just took their monitors and, and uh, keyboard uh, keyboard trays and, and they brought them home. I have a second monitor. I haven't hooked it up yet. And I don't know why that seems like a bridge too far for me. I think it makes me feel like a stockbroker. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like surrounded by screens. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, all right. So let's get to our last story of the day. Um, uh, you know, the the, the 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 VR thing that that this is this comes from a New York Times article that I thought I like the headline a lot. So this should be VR's moment. Why is it still so niche? Um, and not only do you and I both not have headgear, but no one has reached out to us in marketing land and said now's the time to you know, you know, you know the Vive is you know three ninety nine but discounted to two fifteen you know, with some software, but like, you'd think that they would be marketing the hell out of VR. Yeah, I thought when Snapchat released their glasses, like a few years ago, that then Facebook was going to make more of a push with Oculus. Uh, and that that did not happen. Um, so I was wrong on that prediction. And I have not seen a push from really any major player to get, you know, digital early adopters uh, to try it. So uh, hold on, I'm looking at my iPhone as we talk because I've got some questions coming in. Um, 
Uh, um, Phil Horde, not a Mac user. What is Claris? Is it just FileMaker? Um, Phil Horde, I like Apple TV, the service when I tried it. I thought the remote was interesting, but I agree, frustrating. All right. Um, it's very funny. Um, my friend Mark uh, Ostrich says he loves my mustache. So uh, I guess. <laughs> I guess this is what happens when you ask for, for comments from the audience on a live podcast. Um, well, people are paying a lot of attention to hair and grooming habits because there are some unruly people out there who are missing their barber shops and hair cutters, hairdressers. All right. So as long as we talk COVID and, and the opening business, I get barber shops. I guess I do not get the urgency around tattoo parlors. I just, I truly... <laughs> Do you have a tattoo? I do not. I I don't, but my understanding is there's maintenance. Like they fade, you need to get them redone or touched up. Okay, but let's play that out for a second. You're in your house, no one's seeing you, unless the tattoo is on your face. You know, I, it would seem to me <laughs> you could wait until, you know, we've managed COVID to some extent, and then you could go and get the tattoo touched up. But Clearly, a bunch of states think that there's urgency. It's an essential service somehow. I do not understand. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, Alexa, you're now officially out of the city. You're in Pennsylvania. Like, do you know for how long? Yeah, this is just just until uh, Tuesday morning. This this was a temporary experiment, which is proving proving conclusive, which is, is the Wi-Fi and connection out here strong enough to work? The answer is no. <laughs> so all I will say before you scamper back to the city, who provides the Wi-Fi service to, to the house? Verizon. So I would suggest just as a way of broadening your horizons, you call Verizon and say, hey, what's the next step up to make my actual connection not terrible? Because they literally can go, go, click, 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 and push a button and give you, you know, whatever. Because probably whoever bought it bought their low end home service for email. And now there's a bunch of people on it. And like, it would be worth seeing if they could auto magically make it. Like, have you gone on speed.com or speedtest.com just to see how much throughput you're getting? Yeah. So this morning it was uh, five and then it dropped to two at 3 p.m. And then right before we were supposed to record, it completely dropped. And that's when I texted you. So so my guess is that if you called them and made even the slight whimpering sound, they like it costs them nothing to, to open up bandwidth to an individual user. I I hope it's that easy, but I, I do wonder based off of where we are, if they actually need to run fiber. Like well, it they need it's an infrastructure thing. Uh, I will bet you a dollar. So okay. so I, I've just spent the last two weeks calling every vendor in my life and reworking deals and canceling things that were charging me that I'd never noticed, which like, it's like everyone knows that this is kind of a reset time. So, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it if, if it worked, it would be great because this house is otherwise unoccupied. And so uh, it's the perfect perfect place to quarantine and isolate. It, it's unclear to me what New York is going to be like this summer. I mean, you know, uh, de Blasio just pushed through this summer streets, open streets thing that was supposed to be in two weeks and they did it this morning. So a whole bunch of streets are now, you know, have traffic or blocked from traffic so you can walk on the streets. Um, I think nothing in Manhattan yet. I think it's all outer borough stuff, but they're adding more next weekend, you know, so there is something like 42 miles of streets that are going to be closed to traffic. Um, and I think that'll be great. Um, I took a I took an eight mile bike ride today. Um, which oh, was, that's so nice. Wait, yeah. in the, in Central Park, the loop? No. Um, it's kind of a long story. Uh, we, we had to go to Home Depot. The one on 23rd Street? The one on 23rd Street. Wow. Um, and just so long as we're chit chatting about the, the kind of evolution of all this technology. So on their website, Home Depot says, place an order and you can pick it up curbside. Fine. So I roll up to Home Depot and there's a line down the block 
with orange lines on the sidewalk, everyone social distancing. So I walk up to the door and I say to the guy at the door, uh, where's you know curbside pickup? He said, oh, we don't have that here. I said, no, you, you do. It says so on the website. He said, yeah, it's a misunderstanding. So he goes inside, someone else comes out. I said, what do I do about curbside pickup? They said, oh, go to the exit door and oh, wait there and someone will come out. So I'm like, okay, fine. No signage, no clues. I go down to the exit door, I wait. Finally, there's a woman inside the exit door with an iPad and I say, curbside pickup? And she says, oh, the service desk is over there, which is in the store, but still closer than having to wait in line. Just go over there and they'll give you what's, what you ordered. So I walked, you know, past a bunch of people, try, you know, was wearing a mask and gloves, walked to the service desk and gave them my name and my ID and they handed me my, my, uh, my broken, my now replaced broken power tool that I needed. But, um, you know. What an adventure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think I, but I did not want to walk through the store. I was like, you know, I'm not in a shopping mood. I don't really need to go looking for hardware. Just want to go, wanted them to hand me my box. I wanted to bike home. Um, but but it was interesting, I have to say. If you looked around in New York, you could feel people like it's beautiful. First of all, the weather's beautiful. And everyone's like, ah. some people on bikes, some people on city bikes, everyone with masks, almost almost no one not wearing a mask. But then like we got to Columbus Circle and there's like skateboarders and there were a couple of pods of like couples of people preaching and holding Bibles and like, like everyone's trying to like find whatever their connection with the city is, but it's definitely, it felt what was in the air was a mix of joyful spring energy and quiet desperation. Yes. Yep. Like once I saw that the weather was going to be nice this weekend, I was like, I have to get out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, but the reason I asked the question of when you're coming back is if you could make the Wi-Fi 20% better and be able to work for next week, I would say don't race back to the city because, you know, I, th I think, I think this is the, I think we're in the eye of the storm. I really do. Yeah. Um, I think it's a I fair mean, assessment. And I also think that what's happening in Texas and Georgia is just going to be horrible. So um, yeah, um, and VR is not going to save us. There's no, there's no technology that's going to replace being with loved ones, experiencing the outdoors, and uh, not being paranoid about going outside and breathing. I will tell you a good story though. So I, I didn't do this myself, although I'm going to do the next one. But somebody told me they were on a a podcast, uh, um, uh, a Skype call the other day with two thousand people. And it started with 2,000 people in a webinar, and then they broke that 2,000 people up into 12 different groups based on your the first your the, your birth month. So January people met met in one room, and then they had another room set up for February people, another room set up for March. So they broke the 2,000 people up into 12 separate little couple hundred people pods, and then within the little couple hundred people pods they broke them up into breakout rooms. So each of the, so it was 2000 people in a main room and then 12 individual standalone pods and then individual 10 or 12 people per breakout room in each of those pods. And they did kind of like, I don't exactly know what the project was, but they wanted there to be a big presentation and then smaller conversations and then little groups. And then everyone came back to the main room and presented their work. And I was like, that strikes me as a really good um, Zoom hack. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, that I, I I would like to try that. Um, but I but saw something cool the other day. Someone hmm? someone did a tech like series of tech talks on Animal Crossing and then broadcast it to Twitch. I'm gonna need a clue what that means. <laughs> so there's that Nintendo game Animal Crossing. There are more than five million people playing it, including celebrities, and so people are using it as a virtual virtual world with uh, animal avatars, and then they're actually streaming uh, streaming their worlds and characters. So some people used it as a forum for a tech conference. I also know one of the guys who's in uh, Queer Eye. He's doing Animal Crossing home styling tips and makeovers. So that's like to the extent that I feel like VR, AR is having a moment, like a virtual world. 
but it's not VR technology. I just want to say for the record, it's entirely possible you're making this entire thing up and I would believe you because I've never heard of Animal Crossing. <laughs> I'm not making it up. I'm going to send it's, you the links after for this. It's is it like Candy Crush? No, it's like uh, like Farmville, The Sims. Like anytime, it's like world building. Okay, Sims I know. Sims I know. Yeah, I've never, so by the way, listeners, never played Candy Crush. Never. Never, never. going to. <laughs> Tetris, Good. yes. Candy Crush, no. Sims, briefly. Um, had yeah. a bad, had a so bad Sims crossing. experience. It's all, all the rage. Is it just like a street that animals cross? No, it's like you, you make an island and you have to pay off a mortgage and you have to farm things and, you know, you're, you, you interact with the, the people and the things around you. And, uh, it's a remake of an older, older game, uh, that people played. So there's an aspect of nostalgia, but it's, it's wild. Again, there are literally 5 million people playing this. All right. I have two more things. I remember two more things I want to talk to you about. So I was researching the relationship between Donald Trump and um, the, the, the television producer um, uh, who produced The Apprentice, uh, um, whose name now just slips my mind. Um, come to me in two seconds. Um, Mark Burnett. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about whether or not he felt guilty because The Apprentice was on the air for 14 years. And if you look at a lot of what Trump's learned and why he's, in fact, a brilliant social media, you know, implementer, it's because he's, you know, every week on that show, they tested different ways to mistreat people and put pit people against each other and torture people. And, and he checked the ratings to see what people liked. And, you know, that you're fired thing, you know, I mean, when he fires Alex Azar, which he's likely to do next week, or, you know, you know, Anthony Fauci the week after, or, you know, his son-in-law the week after that, that you're fired trick is not something he's making up in the White House. Like that's, that's something it's that he, le- but it worked. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's a, it's a thing that people, he, he saw the ratings, the more he was, anyway, my point was, so, so I, I, I never, I should have known this. And some of my TV friends will say, of course, that they knew it, but like, I never knew that, that Burnett, was both the producer of Apprentice and also of, you know, Survivor. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's how I remember his name originally. I never watched The Apprentice, only Survivor. So if you think about Survivor and Apprentice as kind of the, the a through line to Donald Trump, I mean, I mean, the thing about Survivor is it's exactly that same. It's mean spirit. We're it's sur- all trying to survive this presidency. <laughs> well, and and there's all these alliances that get made, but in the end, everyone screws everyone. And you know, as they fire each person off the island, there's that moment with the torch where they say the tribe has spoken, and they put out your torch. And it's you know, I mean, it's kind of shockingly prophetic. Yeah. You know. I mean, I mean, if, if mass media is sort of a mirror or a reflection of society at large, then it's not surprising that Americans have made these shows popular. Like the, we're consuming something. It's almost like a chicken egg thing. Is, is what you consume informing the people or are the people informing what's popular, right? Yeah. Um, you know, just speaking personally, the idea of of, of the electorate delivering to Donald Trump, either of the catchphrases of those two shows, the tribe is spoken or you're fired, would be totally acceptable to me. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a bumper sticker. Donald Trump, the tribe has spoken. Mm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Donald Trump, you're fired. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then the last thing, which I have not yet written about, but I thought I would chat with you about is, um, do, do you know anything about this app called Citizen? Oh, where the, the, the news alerts? Yeah. The local news alerts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's fascinating. So now that I'm, you know, trapped in my apartment all day, 
when I hear a siren out the window, I kind of want to know what's going on. Like, and so Citizen's fascinating because it starts with the operators of the app listening to police radios and then doing little summaries of the call. So you get a little blip that says two blocks away from your house, you know, um, man assaulted someone with a cane. That was yesterday's. I kind of found that amusing. I'm not sure why. Um, and then there's this whole social media piece that kicks in where people, you know, go, you know, go and gather at that location with their cameras and record video as the police roll up and then post the video on Citizen and then comment on it. Um, so it starts with a fact, which is there's a police radio call. And then it turns into this kind of very Black Mirror-esque, everyone with their phones walking to, and lots of people, lots of video recorded and posted, um, which is um, ironic and interesting. Um, I tried it and I uninstalled it because it made me feel uh, a little bit paranoid. Like if you're not, it's almost like ignorance is bliss. Like there are things happening around you all the time, but once you actually know about all of these official reports, you know, for me, it's like a some often solo woman walking the streets of New York. I was just like, oh, this is making me feel like this could happen to me. Yeah, no, it, it's um, it's it's definitely creepy. I mean, it's it's relevant and useful if you're con I mean, if you're concerned about kind of the rising crime rate and you know civil unrest and all that good stuff that seems like it's on the verge of happening but hasn't happened yet. Um, that being said. Um, uh, I was a little shocked by what Citizen was originally called. Mm. What was so that? Vigilante. Ooh. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. So um, I guess there's been an it's ongoing. It's kind of like ways, but for citizen journalism, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a, that's, that's a good way to describe it. Um, I guess there's been some negotiation between the operators of Citizen and city police departments so that they can, you know, dial down fake news and not amplify things that are inaccurate. Um, I do know for a fact that in New York, uh, firemen are asked to install it on their personal cell phones. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure quite what, I mean, um, but I think it went from being this very radical, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to capture the police doing bad things with cameras to more of a filtered fact checked. I don't know how many people work for citizen. I should find out. Um, it does have real money behind it. It's got, uh, Sequoia money and a couple of other big VCs behind it. Um, but to your point about it, making you uncomfortable, I find myself wondering like, what's, What's the social purpose in knowing that there was a police radio call two blocks away from your house? I mean, is it like your neighbor, your neighborhood watch, but just an evolved form of that? Well, I think it flips it the other way around, though, because neighborhood watch is I've seen something happening and I'm going to call the police. And citizen is someone called the police and something's happening and we're going to tell you where it is and you can go witness it. Like I'm thinking yeah. there's a particular black mirror episode. Um, that's, um, that's exactly that. Um, and I don't now remember what it is. Um, but it's, you know, everybody arrives with their camera phones running. Um, anyway, those are my two things for the week. Um, with that, I, I, it was nice to hear your voice. Sorry, we didn't get to see your face. Um, uh, <laughs> I got more steps in recording because I keep walking to where there's service. That's very funny. Um, by the way, do, do, do if you, if, if, unless you absolutely are coming back to New York anyway, in which case, come on back and we'll see you next week. But it, I would be interested in what Verizon tells you. I would be shocked if they couldn't, like, I mean, I, I, I think I think you almost inevitably buy the smaller package wherever you are first because you think I'm really not going to use this much bandwidth. And why would I pay the extra ten bucks a month for the super duper upgrade? But um, even though you're somewhat in the wilderness, I bet that I will try it. I'd, I'd be shocked. I'd be shocked if there wasn't at least a three x improvement 
for free. And and if they try and charge you for it, you know, just say no, because it's everyone's. I, I hope you're right, Steve. Well, then then you get to stay in the country, and we can do another show next week. Yes. All right. <laughs> See you next week. Bye.